Hello and welcome to the Women in Women Excellence in Law and Leadership or Well Speaker Series, uh, sponsored by the Institute of African Women in Law, together with GIZ. Today we are um, hosting the Women Excellence in Law and Leadership Fireside Chat. My name is Linda Kasonde. I'm your moderator for today. I am the founder of Chapter One Foundation and LCK Chambers. And with me to have this wonderful chat this afternoon are ver three very amazing speakers. Our first uh, guest is uh, Ms. Diana Asonoba Dapa from Ghana. She's the Deputy Attorney General from Ghana. Uh, we also have Mrs. Shlaleleni Kathleen Matolo Glepu from South Africa. She is the former co-chair of the Law Society of South Africa. She is also the founding and executive director of Molife Glepu, a black women-owned law firm in South Africa. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Jumoke Oduwole from Nigeria. And she is a special advisor to the president of the Republic of Nigeria on the ease of doing business. So welcome to all of you ladies. I hope you're all well. Talileni, could you please tell us what characteristics make someone a leader in your view? Thank you first for the Institute for inviting me as a panelist and sharing my, my experiences Car with you. Over the years, I relied on my self-confidence and assertiveness as a leader in my drive to change the status quo. And I, for me, I needed to be noticed by either belonging to an organization, to women grouping, so that we elevate, elevate women into leadership positions, especially in the South African context and South African legal uh, uh, profession. I find myself having to navigate through unconscious biases especially in those very organizations that invited me. And in order to empower myself, I decided to enroll for a course, in a short course in one of the universities uh, on leadership. And why I'm telling you about this to say, as a leader, you have to constantly be learning new things. And in one of those workshops, I discovered certain principles, you know, it's an article, 2016 article written by, I think by Hill C. Miller and Benson on the barriers and biases, the status of women in leadership. And it really resonated with me. And one of the, there were four principles that I've been practicing, but that, that actually reaffirmed what I think a good leader is. The four principles were the me and the we and the work and the world. Under the me, actually, it says you must invest in yourself as a leader. You upskill yourself, always find opportunities that will enable you to make a difference. You have to be a good listener. You must be non-judgmental. Be accessible, you know, setting your own goals that reflect your own values. You have to have that emotional intelligence, actually, that's of self reflecting and having time to yourself to reflect on what people say about you, whether negative or positive, but take them in just to say that they are actually improving, you are going to be improving. You, will, you must be professional at all times and play the game you know, you know, you know, within your own space. Then the second principle, the we part. For me, you have to ask yourself, are you a team worker? Do you explore your own social networks? Why do they, do you motivate others with a view of influencing them? And the work part is that 
what value are you adding in any organization that you, you lead? Are you a game changer? And do you make space for other women to grow within that organization? Do you lift them to where you are? Do you make sure that you, you, you include the younger generation to understand where we are coming from and all those challenges that we have been having, especially us who have been there before? Do you listen to them and so that you give them all the confidence that they, they, they will make a difference? And the world part, the world principle for me, it says, do you embrace change or are you part of the community? Because if you are not, there's no way you can lead. Uh, you have to enhance and upskill yourself on mediation and negotiation skills. And also, and always understand the context and the environment that you are leading. You must know your subject very well. You know, find a situation to always empower each time, always empower your peers, your, the younger generation, so that at least there, there is people who will come after you. It shouldn't be you alone. You must build relationships and win the trust of people you work around. You know, I, 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 I normally want to work with younger women in the sense that they, they always bring innovation, nuances, new nuances, how they understand issues. And it's, I, I find it very, very empowering. So in short, I'm saying that there, there are those, the principles are the same, but you must work as a team leader. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm pleased to see that your daughter, Laura, is here today. So we're very honored to have her in the audience as well. Um, very briefly, um, Mrs. Uh, Diana, could you please tell us what uh, you think the characteristics are of a leader? Thank you, especially to the IAWL for having me here. It is a delight to be in the midst of these very accomplished women to have this conversation. Now, in respect of the question, what characteristics make someone a leader? I have um, come from a background where my understanding of leadership is about service. And so a, a good leader or a great leader for that matter is one who understands and appreciates that the whole idea of being a leader is to serve, is to positively impart the lives of the people you lead. Now, against this backdrop, to be able to efficiently lead through the servant leadership for me are certain traits that a leader must possess. And I believe that um, the immediate speaker um, highlighted some of them. And I'll just like to add on to it. You will need the strength because trust me, it is not um, a walk in the park being a leader in whatever field or role you find yourself. And so you need to consistently remind yourself to be strong, to build the strength. A leader, a servant leader for that matter, is one that perseveres, is tenacious in all her dealings to ensure that the aims of the people that he or she leads, the, the aims and vision and goals of the people that she leads are achieved. Of course, another trait that a great leader must have is the learning spirit. And I believe my colleague just mentioned them. Now the learning spirit involves the ability to learn, to unlearn and relearn. And related to that, you, a leader is one that must be able to listen and to be able to, in the quest to listen, to be able to sift through bad advice and be able to, as it were, dismantle her own ideologies and rather adopt best practice because there's new knowledge coming up every day. And so a great leader is someone that's able to learn relearn and unlearn. Also a great leader is one that is able to appreciate and value the support system that comes from even the people that she leads. And in this regard, I can overemphasize the, the value, the importance of support. And these supports can be um, family, can be friends, can be experienced persons or role models within the space in which you lead. 
and they should be your your greatest cheerleaders and your genuine critics and a great leader is one that is able to take on advice and constructive critique from these uh, strong support and finally to sum it all up i believe that a great leader is one just like a christian who is not who is able not to only preach the virtues that he desires but also to live by her own life these virtues and in so doing when you're able to bring the people you lead along and you move because they look up to you and see that the very things you talk about in terms of discipline in terms of integrity are things that you live by and so for me a great leader is one that has the ideology that leadership is about service and that leader lives by these um, traits that i've discussed thank you Thank you, service above self. And of course, my favorite uh, quotation on service is by Martin Luther King Jr. who once said, not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great because mm. great is determined by service. My next question is to Diana. You are the current Deputy Attorney General for the Republic of Ghana, firstly, well done. Um, prior to this position, you were in private practice with um, Ozu Samukujetu and Associates. Yes, that's right. Sorry. And um, you also lectured. Could you please share your leadership journey with us? Right. Um, thank you. I, as I earlier mentioned, I came from a background where leadership is understood to be um, a call to duty or service. And so my leadership journey, if I recall rightly, started from my high school, which is um, Wesley Girls High School in Cape Coast, Ghana. In fact, I was the first assistant um, school prefect. Then I remember the, the head girl, the main head, head girl whom I assisted, we used to have a, a jacket on as school prefects. I had one as well, but the main head girl had the inscription behind her jacket, I came to serve. And so it is from this background that we were trained to understand that leadership is about service. So my journey began from um, Wesley Girls High School, where I was the first assist assistant girls prefect. From there, I moved to the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. The Faculty of Law had then started. It was in its second year, if I recall rightly. And I remember in my third year, I stood and competed with um, of four gentlemen for the position of president of the Law Students Union then. And I was elected um, as the first female president of the Law Students Union. Now, prior to that, I had engaged myself with other student politics or services. I was the, what we call the National Union of Ghana Students. I was the head of programs and projects for the National Union of Ghana Students chapter at my university, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And so that for me also helped to cut my teeth in leadership at that point of being in student politics. And so all then all the way to the law school and I, I took a bit of break until uh, I was called to the bar where I engaged myself in a number of uh, um, leadership roles, particularly on committees like the Continuous Legal Education Committee helped to be one of the founding members to set up the Young Lawyers Forum within the Ghana Bar Association. And I also had the opportunity to work closely as um, with, with some presidents of the Ghana Bar Association. And at that level of serving as assistants in one way or the other, particularly as personal assistant to the then president of the Ghana Bar Association, um, Nena Megacho, who is now a justice of the Supreme Court. You are within the space of leadership together with your boss whom you, you're serving and that there's, you can also appreciate the, the task and duty on you as a, a support staff, if I should say, for um, the main man who is the president of the Ghana Bar Association. And I also work closely in that role as a support, as a research assistant to the the then Chief Justice, first female Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, Justice Georgina Wood, whom I still have a very good relationship with. And of course, at the within the GIMPA space, the university where I lecture, I also served on a number of committees like the disciplinary committee um, 
capacity building and development committee of, um, of, of Kempa. And so the journey throughout has basically been about learning from role models um, up from, from high school where we were trained, you have allies. And within there, you would have um, old girls come to the school and give you inspiration of, of how to be a good leader. So my journey basically has spanned from uh, my senior high school uh, up until last year when I was nominated uh, into this position and very humbled by this position, which I have um, served uh, in the last couple of months. I think um, June will be one year since I was um, nominated into this position. So that has been my um, journey so far. It's, it started off from student leadership or student politics, if, if, if I may call it that way, up until professional um, leadership, that is uh, as a lawyer and as a lecturer within GEMPA. So that has been my journey so far. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe before I move on, um, you were the first female student uh, leader of the Law Students Union. Uh, tell us in a sentence or two about what it's like to break barriers for women in the legal field. Right. Um, I wouldn't say that it was um, particularly uh, uh, easy for me to be then to just break that barrier, but I think peculiar to my situation then what um, was one of the um, election mantra for me was that, and it helped quite surprisingly, was that we had tried the men and it was time for us um, to try a woman. But of course, I do not believe that that mantra alone could have um, inured to my benefit or my election had it not been the sure of um, my experience previously. Recall that I had then served as a student leader within the National Union of Ghana Students and um, I, had also, I had also put myself to task. I think what helped, and I'll speak more about it later, was to put myself up for duty. I had served, there had been two presidents before and I had served them on numerous committees. And so much as it would have been ordinarily difficult because you had a woman and the skepticism may have been high, I think in my case, it had been, what had inured to my benefit was that um, I had proven within the number of years that I'd been in the faculty as to my capabilities and, uh, and uh, my ability to be in that position. And, also the mantra that it was time to test the woman and women were also capable. But that notwithstanding, I wouldn't say that it was, really it was easier at that time because of the barriers that are associated with women in leadership. Thank you. Thank you. So proven record and putting yourself out there. Uh, I'll turn to you, uh, I'll turn back to you, Dr. Jamoke. I hope you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I believe um, you have the four C's that characterize a, a, a good leader. And perhaps as you tell us those four C's, you can proceed to tell us about your journey uh, to becoming the presidential advisor to the president of Nigeria on the ease of doing business. Maybe I'll, I'll leave school apart or just start from the end of school. So somewhere in the middle, right there of university, just the idea of, of accepting the average became a bit unpleasant to me. And I just realized that I was very interested in stretching. And at the time I finished undergrad, we'd had some issues in the Nigerian educational system. There'd been some strikes and things like that. So I very much had wanted to leave the country for my education. And, and I had other people that had just to have a better quality at the time, but I couldn't. So this was really early on. I didn't have an email address or anything, but I went to the British Council. I wrote letters. And the end of the story is that I got a full scholarship to Cambridge University for my um, LLM. The, the, my parents basically just needed to drop me at the airport and pick me up. And it was a DFID Cambridge Commonwealth Trust. And I'll come back to that, um, why I point that out later. But excellence becomes a habit you see that it holds you in, get, in good stead for other opportunities. So when I came back home as promised, I started working in investment banking, but I quickly realized that 
I wasn't super committed to being the CEO of a bank. And if I wasn't interested in getting to the very top, then why am I going to be vested for so many years? What was interesting was getting a lot of skills in that area. My big plan was to go back into corporate law after about five years. But after more banking in another commercial bank, I decided that academia was where I wanted to um, have the most impact on people's minds. So uh, did some more years in academia and, and to move up the ladder in academia, you really should get a doctorate. So I applied mm -hmm. to Stanford University. And of course, having gone to Cambridge, I got into Stanford. Um, very interesting, I, I pivoted from core commercial law into international law and development, international economic law. And the story there is while I was at Cambridge, I had gone to the WTO on a field trip. And that was really my first exposure to the asymmetry between um, developing and, and developed countries and the impact of international trade and multilateral agreements on economies and on people. So I got very interested in development work. And from development work, um, went into teaching that. At first I got in for commercial law, and then I had to work my way. In all these, you have to weave in, first of all, having the character to stay the course, and then really honing your competence as you go along. You need to maneuver space. For instance, I got in for commercial law, but I was more interested in um, international law. So I had to negotiate space to cross over departments at that time, because we still have sort of strong Chinese walls at the, at the Faculty of Law of the University of Lagos. And um, negotiating space with colleagues, you really have to have the courage to speak up and ask. So having gone for my doctorate and, and now working very hard in international law, I'm making a, a, a career in academia because I wanted to impact people. I did spend a lot of time, perhaps more time than teaching law, in mentoring people, um, at, at the university, at church, just a lot of activity with young people around me. And I felt, I remember where I was when, when my boss, the vice president was nominated. I felt government is even more impactful, more millions of lives you can affect. So I put up my hand again for that job. And thankfully he knew my pedigree, we'd worked together. He chaired a, um, the board of a nonprofit that I ran for a couple of years. And he knew also that I had this um, very prestigious um, distinct professorship in the Netherlands, the Prince Carl's chair. Now, all those things weaven together, when they're all woven together, you have different exposure, investment banking with academia, with uh, working non-for-profit, and then going into government. The common theme is wanting to make an impact, staying true to your values, who you are, and knowing that integrity and excellence and hard work, there's no shortcut. And also knowing that you have to work with people to be able to make an impact. So that uh, speaks to capability to be able to import change. So as a, as a change agent, as a reformer in government for the last seven years, those are the skills that have put me in good stead. Um, that's the, the summary of the story. It's, it's still unfolding, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I like what you say about excellent, excellence becoming a habit and your, I think it's four C's, character, competence, courage, and I think change, you're having change, you're having impact. Uh, Saleleni, I'll turn back to you. Um, you are an activist for women's empowerment uh, and a pioneering uh, executive director of Molithi Dlepu incorporated since 1994, and a former co-chairperson of the Law Society. Could you tell us about your leadership journey, in particular, why you are, have become a uh, women's empowerment advocate? You know, my, my journey, I think like Diane, starts from, from high school. You know, I attended uh, Morris Isaacson, which was one of those schools that drove the June uprisings, fighting the system. and. We were, at the school, black consciousness was instilled in us. And I remember we had one teacher, unfortunately she died. He died of a letter bomb, which was sent to him in Botswana. Uh, it's the late Abraham Okopo Tetiro. 
And he always taught us that whether you want to change attitudes, a political system or patriarchy, you must stand up and make it happen. Nobody will make it happen for you, whether you are male or female. You are the only person who can liberate yourself, working with others, you can liberate yourself. So it really stayed with me. I was very young. And during all those uprisings, I always thought of when I remembered that at the age of six, my family, my grandfather was forcefully removed from Limpopo. And we were dumped you know, in a barren land area. We had left a house that he really built for himself. And it really broke him because he couldn't, he didn't have the strength to, of rebuilding his life. And I always thought to myself, I have to do something to restore his image, to restore his, his, his pride. And being a, 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 a woman, and from a family of very strong women, my mother is a very strong woman. She always belonged to an organization one way or the other, a women's league, you know, we always accompanied her, you know, or she always led a community organization. So that leadership, you know, that leadership quest really was instilled in me at a very young age. We had, we had to learn to survive, as you know, the South African legal system was very uh, harsh. But my journey, that really made me want to be a leader, was when I attended the university. And, you know, the University of the North, during my time, I think we were 40 in the class, in the, in the class, four of us were, only four were women. And as you know, in universities, faculties have, they have to be, have representatives to represent them at the SRCs. And the, the law faculty call for elections, you know? And I decided to raise my hand. I think it was, I was very young. I said, I, I want to be part of this. I was elected firstly as a, as a treasurer. Then I became a student advisor. I never looked back. So for me, it, it, it has been that journey that I wanted to make a difference. So when I, after saving my articles, and I served articles, you know, it was very tough then with a, with a male dominated firm. Actually, I think I was the only woman candidate in. And I remember my, my my principal there used to say to me, you have to belong. You have to belong in this legal uh, uh, environment, being a black woman. You need to belong, embrace your peers, share ideas, you know, that's how I joined the Black Lawyers Association. Having joined that, I never look back. Each time I made sure that I stand for elections and one way or the other, I will be part of that uh, executive. And one of the things that I pride myself in, together with Buto Bapoyo, I think, you know, some of you know her, and Andy. So we actually made sure that the Black Lawyers Association changes its constitution to make sure that out of the executive of seven, at least three of them are women and women to occupy really meaningful positions. And since then, I've been preaching that and they adopted that constitution. But going on, every time I used to raise my hand, if they, if in the law faculty, or I mean, in, in law organizations, I used to raise my hand. But one, one, the reason I did that, I was trying to break this stereotype that women cannot lead. And I challenged myself to be the best of the best. I made sure that 
all the, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that women, we attend these meetings in numbers because we had to vote for each other. Men will never vote for you. They want us to be their cheerleaders. They'll approach you and say, I want to stand for this, for this position, but they'll never say, Khalilin, can we, can we nominate you? So you only got nominated by women. And without women in South Africa, we wouldn't be here where I, were, I am. Then after finishing, to, for me to open a law, female-owned law firm, after passing my board exam, myself and a colleague who's now a judge, I think two of them, we decided, no, no, no. We are going to have a female-owned law firm and we'll be biased and train female youngsters as candidate attorneys. And we, have, we did that. We made sure, because the reason why, because when you look at the legal profession, there are so many more women who are coming out of universities, but very few of them go to the top or become owners or become partners. And it, it was my, my drive to say, we need, they need to see us as role models so that we can make it our way. So since I have been doing that and driving transformation within the legal profession of South Africa, it's, it's still my case to do that. And I'm training everybody. You know, my, my daughter will always say, there you go again. When they say there's a position in the law society, then I raise my, she says, oh, mommy, there you go again. I said, but I need to change the status quo. We need to do something as women. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, the anti-apartheid struggle had a very a lasting impact on you as a woman uh, and particularly as a black woman. Uh, there is a South African saying that when you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And I believe that probably sums up what your mother was to you and how you yourself have carried yourself through your leadership journey. I also like the fact that um, and it's a common theme throughout uh, all the speakers that they've all raised their hands. So for those of you out there who have yet to put themselves forward for leadership positions, you've got to put yourself out there uh, in order to get to the top. And the other thing I really liked about you, uh, your presentation was you mentioned that um, you deliberately worked together as women to advance the transformation agenda in terms of uh, gender uh, equity uh, in the law society and other organizations that you've been a part of. So that's also something that I think we should take away. I'll now move to Jumoke. What are your suggestions for addressing the challenges faced by women in leadership? Well, I think that it's really very important to start from the very beginning, how you bring up a, a child, both female and male, so I have a daughter, I have a son, and they do exactly the same. The girl is older and, and there's no way my son doesn't know to look up to his sister and exactly what she has to do. Being, um, she was the house chef for about three years before she went, left the country. And he's now the house chef and he cooks excellently well. So it's important for us to handle those gender biases from the get-go. I have a father that was a feminist. He had three girls and one boy, and there was nothing that ever made me feel. In fact, that was the remarkable thing in the tribute I wrote when he passed away last January, that he, he told me once that I could win the Nobel Prize. So the, the bar was that set that high. And when I speak with other women that are leading and sort of strong out there that have the confidence, because I think something that's really important is confidence. That would be my, my last C. And you get that from home, you get that from those around you to know that you're not an imposter, you belong there. So I always, I mean, there are a lot of policies you could say that organizations should have a firm. those all those things are good but they are add-ons we need to build up the girl from inside let her know she's worthy and equip her to 
be the captain of her own ship. She's in charge of her own destiny. She's not a victim. She's not a damsel in distress. And if she doesn't like a job, she needs to move on. If she wants a career, she needs to go for it, whether it's a government, whether it's a security agency, whether it's uh, in politics, private sector, whether she wants to stay home and raise kids, she shouldn't have society dictate to her what success means. Success should really be driven by what is deep within her. And she should be the best at whatever it is she sets her mind to. So that's also the theme of being responsible and not waiting for external factors, which are good and can help. But I'm a very big advocate for working for within, mentoring people. My team is like 70% female, the, the guys feel, and, and they didn't get the jobs because they're female. They got the jobs because they deserve the roles and because they're that good. But it takes intentionality, looking out and seeing that um, excellence out there and then nurturing it and letting them know that they can thrive, they can soar. So for me, I would, in summary, work on the psyche of my mentees, of my students, of my daughter, of all those around me to make sure that they believe in themselves, first of all, because no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'm also a firm believer that charity does actually begin at home. I'm also from, from a home in which there was no um, gender, you know, everybody was treated the same. I have one brother and two sisters, so I completely identify with that. Um, also, um, you talked about success being personal to the individual. And um, there is a saying that um, success is liking what you do, how you do it, uh, and when you do it. So it's really a personal thing. Um, yeah, I will move on to... Um, I, I hope you heard me. I don't even know what's going on today. I've used like three networks. I just don't know what the problem is, but I hope you heard me. Yes, <laughs> yes, we did. Thank you. We did. Um, I'll move on to Diana. Uh, what strategies would you propose for increasing the pipeline of women in leadership positions? Right. Um, thank you. Um, only except to, I mean, perhaps emphasize the the importance of, um, like Dr. Jumoke mentioned, the importance of what I call positive vibes and um, positive energy from the people around you. And I have also been lucky to have had that from my, my father and my phenomenal brothers, you know, and you can never overemphasize the value of having people who do not patronize or butter you but who, even though it's difficult, would tell you is doable. Now, on the strategies, I believe that, and here I want to sound a caution to all women, that it is not, um, it's not a pity party as a woman that you expect that being a woman and the whole advocacy of having women at the forefront of things means that things will just fall into your lap. The strategies for increasing the pipeline of women in leadership position behoves upon us as women to develop ourselves. At the end of the day, it should be more about competent and efficient women rather than being a woman. And for me, that is one of the greatest tools that we can have as women beyond advocacy. Beyond advocating for more women, it behoves upon us as women to develop ourselves. And I believe that life is a continuing learning. You learn, you unlearn, and you relearn. And so within the space that you find yourself, be it public office, be it private office, wherever you find yourself, new knowledge come up each day. It is important that to increase women in leadership positions, we should be ready when the time is right. We should be found ready, able, and capable. And that means continuously developing yourself as a woman within whatever role or um, a task or profession that you find yourself in. For me, that is a very important call. 
And um, another um, way by which we can increase women in leadership positions is by being role models ourselves, by building other women up. Time and again, you hear the unfortunate um, argument that women are our own enemies. If we are advocating for more women in leadership positions, then we need to bear each other up. We need to hold each other. We need to be good role models for other women, whether below or above us. And so for me, beyond self-development to increase women in leadership positions, it behoves upon us as women to be phenomenal and great role models and allies for other um, women. And um, I think in doing this, we'll be able to change the narrative and mindset of um, the community in which we find ourselves, that these people are not crying foul just because they are women, but indeed they have proven themselves worthy. They have proven themselves capable and we need to open up, not give them the chance because with their women, but they are indeed, they have indeed proven that they are capable to perform when put in these leadership positions. And I think one of the ways by which um, we can also increase women in leadership position is by daring to be different, by daring to be innovative. And at the end, underlining, as I've earlier mentioned, by daring to change the status quo. I keep saying that it is not a competition. It is not a battle. It is what it is that we are capable and we deserve to be there, not out of pity, but because we have proven ourselves to be capable. So in summary, for me, I think when the, the, the bell strikes as a woman, you should be ready. And you can only be ready when you yourself have developed yourself. It will not fall in your lap, I keep telling people. And it means learning, on learning and relearning. And I believe another important role is for us as women, first of all, to be good role models and allies ourselves, to bring other women up and to, and, to, and to bear each other up and to hold each other up to wherever we desire and aspire to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. So be opportunity ready, be competent and efficient, be a good role model and be a good ally. Uh, so I'll now move on to ask each one of you in three bullet points to give your three takeaways as to how women can become effective leaders and leave a substantive uh, impact. Um, I'll start with you, Ms. Salelin. The, the three bullet points that I'd like to, to leave the, the participants with is that you, you need to be very confident, be, be very comfortable in your own skin. You look for mentors who you really can, who are reachable. You must look at what other women are doing and try and be part of that to change that narrative. So for me, make sure that you, you, you embrace other women organizations, whether it's doctors, whether it's archaeologists, anybody, as long as they, they advance the quest of women leadership. Make sure that you are there. You can be a leader, you can be a leader in the church, you start, you can start small. That's how you build yourself up. I think be out there, raise your hand and be noted. Thank you very much. I'll move on to you, Dr. Jamoke. Uh, your three takeaways. I think that we've all been sort of, these are amazing women on the panel, by the way. We've all been sort of pointing out the same things and reinforcing them, and that's a really good sign. I mean, the first one I would say is to be a lifelong learner, to just keep on learning and learning because that's what really makes you competent and ahead of the curve all the time. Uh, you want to give yourself stretch targets. So immediately you reach a goal, set another one because that's yesterday's news, that's old news. So set yourself a target, push yourself with excellence. Don't plateau, you never arrive. Just keep working hard. And these goals are not necessarily about money or position or whatever it is that's meaningful to you, set those goals and keep setting stretch targets for yourself. And the last thing, being a teacher, the core of me is a teacher, I would say, invest in your team, invest in those you're leading, invest in your mentees, invest in the younger people around you, listen to them and mentor them and be a responsible role model. So when you teach, you also uh, reinforce your own learning 
and that makes you accountable. So it propels you forward and it keeps you evergreen when you mix around with a lot of young people. So for me, those are really <laughs> good things I'm telling you, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jamoke. Um, and you certainly do look evergreen. As uh, Maya Angelou used to say, when you learn, teach. Lastly, uh, your three takeaways, uh, Ms. Diana, uh, on how to become an effective leader. I'm sure you've touched on this before, but if you could concisely wrap it up into yeah. three points. Thank you. I think three takeaways, um, like Doc mentioned, the way we all happen to be saying the same thing in different ways. And that highlights the importance of what we've been seeing all along, which is that self-development. Mm. Be ready when the opportunity strikes and continue to be a good listener. And related to that, I always mention that you should um, build the capacity to um, sift bad advice from good advice. And for me, the threshold, the keyhole is knowing that whatever advice and yours to impact in the lives of others is almost always a good advice. And so for me, it's self-development, learning to listen and learn from others and be able to sift through um, the advices you receive. And finally, to remember, like I said, true leadership is about service. And as I mentioned, I always had, we always had at the back of our jackets in Wesley Girls, the head girl always had at the back of her jacket, I came to serve. And that leadership is about service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that the theme running through everything is one, raise your hand, service above self, confidence, competence, excellence. Uh, and I think uh, all three women here today embody those things. Okay, so I'm just going to open the Q&A box. Uh, our first question is from Ms. Priscilla Nurenda. Uh, it is with regards to emotional intelligence. Uh, she believes it's something that you can acquire whilst doing your LLB. Please shed more light on this. And also how can one acquire legal skills generally uh, while studying? Secondly, how does one choose which area of law best suits them? And Noraya Kamutumwa asks, how does a woman exactly position themselves for leadership opportunities in the legal fraternity that, that is widely dominated by men and what time does one begin to brand themselves for that position i'm asking because i'm a law student i don't know if i should start branding myself now in my second year or wait for a certain stage so i'll, I'll take these uh three questions first and i'll direct uh one to each of you so the first one was about emotional intelligence can you can you learn that at your llb and uh, how does one acquire legal skills generally? I'm gonna pose that question to Diana because I believe she raised the issue of emotional intelligence earlier. Um, so if you could just take that question, please. Thank you for that question. I think um, the, the, the traditional LLB program, I do not think, in fact, perhaps within the syllables or the course outline includes a course or, on emotional intelligence. And I believe for most traditional LLB education is something that you have to acquire through additional training in others. And it's, it's, it's very important and particularly for law students, considering the stress, the distractions, the challenges that come with um, legal education. So it depends on the faculty in which you're enrolled, I would say, you know, ordinarily some may have um, student affairs within the university which runs some of these trainings but I mean you put it quite right that how do you emotional intelligence first of all you identify the importance of emotional um, intelligence in law education but quite unfortunately I do not think the standard or the traditional LLB education for most universities that I'm aware um, provide that and so for me you hit it rightly that you bring to the fore the importance of learning some of these um, um, sequential, should I say, um, um, skills of emotional intelligence, because it's something you need even beyond your legal education as, um, as a, 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 in, your, in your career as a, as a legal practitioner. And so it, all is not lost if that is not identifiable within your LLB education. 
once you realize you and I identify that this is important, I believe when I was a law student, I would during the vacation take up certain um, studies. For instance, I, I took French, I took ICT, then it was, it had come up, the whole lessons of ICT in, uh, in your career had come up. And for emotional intelligence for the past few years that I can recall it, it's very imperative. And to be able to not just engage with others, but for your own sanity, as a law student, uh, it's very key. And I believe that if you do not get it within your legal fraternity, there's still opportunity. And as I believe, as I mentioned, these, these things do not fall on your lap. You have to have the thirst to learn some of these things. So I don't know if that answers your question, but traditionally within the LLB education, I am not sure that this is, comes part of comes as part of um, the core syllabus or outline. But these are things that I would recommend for you on the side to acquire these skills. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can't claim to be an expert in this field, but I certainly know that there are many books on this issue that one can read. Uh, I'll move on to Dr. Jumoke. Um, how does one choose which area of law best suits them? So what I always tell my students is that law is actually an excellent foundation. It's an excellent background because law is life. So it really depends on who you are and getting to know yourself and what inspires you, motivates you, what you're passionate about. So I know lawyers who are real sports enthusiasts and they either have a legal career in sports or they pivoted into another direction entirely. I have um, classmates that are now leading fashion designers on the continent. I have, uh, of course, people have gone into banking and the law itself. When you look at the law, health law, environmental law, uh, family law, criminal law, it really speaks to, because law covers the whole gamut of human life, corporate law, um, tax law. So how technical are you? What areas, oil and gas? Are you somebody really interested in being very wealthy? So pick areas, if you are, then you pick an area where it's really lucrative, but you have to look at your strengths. Are you somebody who's really passionate about abuse? So family law, um, children, criminal law. So you want to go either public law, private law. It really depends on the individual and getting to know yourself and then identifying the opportunities that are available around you and how you can key in. So I'm a lawyer, I went into investment banking. I became passionate about making an impact, not necessarily making money. Although I'm not allergic to money, it wasn't my primary motivation. So I pivoted into academia, first of all, and then I further pivoted into public service. I've been working as an advisor in government for seven years, and now I'm getting quite political. I've been appointed as, as a, a member of the board of trustees for political parties, professional forum. So really following your passions. So if, so if your passion is to make as much impact as possible, how does the law create a foundation for you to do that? So remembering that law is a foundation, do well in your law because those skills and that knowledge will serve you well wherever you go. Thank you, excellent lessons there, transferable to any career. And also, uh, I came across a great TED talk that you might want to look up, uh, Noraya. Um, it was about a woman who pivoted in her legal career. And her advice was to do what you like being good at. Uh, so it's not enough uh, to, to have a passion. It's not enough to be good at something. The, the, the connection between the two things is where your sweet spot will lie. And last but certainly not least, Madam Shaleleni, could you please tell us um, how does a woman position themselves for leadership uh, opportunities in the legal, legal fraternity that is widely dominated by men? And what time, when do you start branding yourself? I think you're, you're the excellent person to, 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 to answer this question. <laughs> you, you know, I because I, I, I lived my life in South Africa, you know, and I, every time I wanted to change the status quo within the country, for you to be able to be good, you need to, I mean, we, we, we've got women organizations, 
that most of us have started. For instance, I've got an organ, an NPO called Basadi Babolao, where we train me, women, you know, to be uh, in advocacy skills, in you know, mediation, in ADR, and you, we we encourage them to attend webinars like this one, you know, where you you tend to see other women who are excelling, and emulate them and you i mean this is a platform where you start, now you know diana you now you know oh dr one uh, uh, Jomo, okay, you, now you know dr Jabba. so you 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 can actually send an email and say but how do i navigate myself you know to be a good leader and be recognized but at the same time i think you you have to start a university we are fortunate in south africa because I also belong to a South African Women Lawyers Association, where we create student chapters in every university. Also, the Black Lawyers Association, we do that. We embrace them so that we, we teach them what's ahead of their profession. So they attend our meetings, we attend their meetings, we teach them all the skills. So by the time they complete you have already identified whom you want as your candidate attending because of their, their activism, of, the, of their confidence. So it, it helps to go out there, attend webinars, be part of a collective, uh, attend women groups, uh, you know, and, and, and also you, you must really men who have already crossed the road before, make them feel guilty to teach you, you know, and, and I, I've seen it happen to me because I always say, you know, I need to be there and men have always been there. You are going to teach me because you believe in women empowerment. So that's why I'm saying that as, as, a, as a young law student belong to this organization, especially at the university level, there are a lot of them when you come out this Black Lawyers Association, this Nadel, is the Law Society of South Africa where we offer embryo training and there are NGOs, I know, UNISA has a street law project, which is, I really love, you know, where they teach their students to go to, you know, uh, uh, to communities, you know, and, and you should see how confident those students are. So you, you, you need to put yourself out there. Branding, you have to brand yourself every day. You have to, to embrace innovation. I, I didn't understand social media because of my age. But my daughter said, for you to succeed, mommy, you have to be part of, of LinkedIn, you know, all the social medias. So you, you, you brand yourself and in, embrace your innovation, you know, ask other women how they do it. We gladly offer advice for those who want us to actually advise them. So I think you have to be out there. You have to do it for yourself. You cannot sit in a corner and think things will happen for you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, so I'll just summarize our discussion uh, this afternoon. Firstly, service above self. As a leader, you must be a servant leader, uh, not only to the people in your team, but also for the cause that you're, that you're leading for. Excellence is a habit. Be excellent, as, as I think Michelle Obama once said, it's the best answer to all your detractors. Raise your hand. It's no good being competent and sitting somewhere because uh, as a woman particularly, your efforts won't be noticed. You've really got to be proactive about your leadership journey and uh, push yourself forward. Character, competence, courage, confidence, I've missed the C, but I think it was about having impact change. Um, the, the five C's. Um, be a good role model and more importantly, be a good ally for other women who are aspiring for leadership. Um, maybe to the last, uh, the, the last question, um, building a brand is, is a process. I, 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 I know that the, the media presents it as something that can happen overnight, but uh, the reason why the three women here are standing with such high positions is because it's been consistency over time. Uh, and that's how you build a brand. Um, 
And lastly, uh, to Dr. Jumoko's point, when you learn, teach. So thank you very much to all our wonderful panelists today, uh, Madam Tlaleleni Glepo, um, Madam Diana Asonaba Dapa, and of course, last but certainly not least, Dr. Jimoke Oduwole. Thank you very much for your participation. I hope you enjoyed the session and I'm sure there'll be a recording out there if you want to watch it again. Thank you also to our hosts, the Institute for African Women in Law, and also to GIZ for the sponsorship of this program. Thank you very much to you all and have a good day. <laughs>